I'd like to welcome you to my presentation. Today, I'll be speaking about the engineering and implementation of dityrosine bonds in order to stabilize viral fusion proteins for their use as subunit vaccines. My name is Mark Yandola. I'm the Vice President for Research and Development at Calder Biosciences. And I've been working for a little more than seven years on this technology as a member of Calder Biosciences. So although their localization to the surface of the virus particle and their critical role in the viral life cycle makes them attractive targets for subunit vaccines, viral fusion proteins are inherently unstable and by definition readily undergo a transition between the pre-fusion and the post-fusion states in order to accomplish virus entry and the initiation of the viral life cycle. This inherent instability makes them very difficult to harness and use as subunit vaccines. And the two proteins I'll be speaking about today are the RSV fusion protein and the influenza HA protein, which both of which suffer from conformational instability in the form that we would like to present to the immune system. Before we enter the field, considerable progress was made by the Vaccine Research Center, specifically in the labs of Peter Kwan and Barney Graham, together with Jason McClellan. They were able to accomplish a significant stabilization of the pre-fusion state of the RSVF protein. This was accomplished through point mutation and the engineering of an additional disulfide bond into the molecule. This enabled the identification of the determination of the crystal structures of these molecules. And it was shown that many of the neutralizing epitopes or the most potently neutralizing epitopes are present only in the pre-fusion state and become lost on the transition to post-fusion. This stabilization also enabled vaccination studies and they were able to show roughly a tenfold increase in mean neutralization titers upon vaccination of non-human primates with a molecule that maintains this pre-fusion state. So we sought to collaborate with the inventors of this molecule, which is called DSCAP1, in order to introduce dityrosine bonds into a similar background in order to generate a more potent and stable molecule as it would have manufacturing advantages and also potentially more potency. The influenza hemagglutinin molecule also, also suffers from conformational instability when the approach is taken to present a headless HA molecule or a stock domain only in the absence of the globular head. This approach is taken because the globular head domain contains the major antigenic sites for the molecule and upon infection, the immune system targets this region, generating neutralizing antibodies. However, these antibodies are often strain specific due to the process of antigenic drift, where the head in fact mutates over time, which causes the uh, vaccine to be updated on a yearly basis. So the idea of a headless HA molecule is to present the immune system with the less immunogenic stock domain, given that it's primarily conserved year to year, and elimination of the head uh, would allow focusing the immune responses on the stock domain. And it's been shown that the stock domain itself presents, presents neutralizing epitopes to the immune system. However, attempts have been made to recombinantly splice the head domain from the molecule and or to proteolytically remove the head domain after it's folded. And this results in a loss of the stock, stock confirmation. So Calder's approach is to apply the additional stability that a dityrosine crosslink imparts to both of these problems in an effort to lock in specific confirmations and generate the most potent prefusion specific or confirmationally intact immunogens. In 
Dityrosine bonds are present throughout nature, and they're, they're applied and, and found in areas of proteins where a great deal of structural rigidity is required. The dityrosine bond itself is zero length and occurs between tyrosine side chains. So therefore, they need to be within a few angstroms of each other for the bond to form. It's a direct carbon-carbon bond. Dityrosine bonds are present throughout nature and are found in the plant kingdom, in the walls of bamboo. In the insect kingdom, there's a protein called resolin that is highly viscoelastic, present in the joints of grasshoppers and dragonflies. They're present naturally in the human aorta, which undergoes a great deal of shear stress. And those of us that are still consuming carbs readily eat dityrosine bonds daily as they are formed during the process of bread making. Calder takes a three-step approach to engineering and implementing dityrosine bonds. We first use structural-based analysis to target dityrosine bonds to specific regions of the protein in order to maintain either the pre-fusion state or specific conformational epitopes that are highly desirable in terms of the generation of neutralizing antibodies. We then perform conservative or two tyrosine mutations by site-directed mutagenesis. We express that protein and purify it. And then we conduct an enzymatic reaction on the fully folded protein in order to introduce the dityrosine bonds into the molecule. As I mentioned, because the bond is zero length, it does not distort the molecule. Additionally, we, we take advantage of the fact that the bonds are, need to be in close proximity and a proper geometry. And it allows a very specific targeting since the bond formation only occurs between tyrosine side chains. The diatyrosine bond in, in, introduces additional covalent, covalent bonds into the molecule. And therefore, we call them molecular staples, which maintain specific conformations, oftentimes preserving quaternary epitopes. Because additional bonds are formed and the molecule is stabilized, the dityrosine bond prolongs the shelf life of the molecule, has the potential to mitigate cold chain requirements, and we believe increases patient exposure in vivo and allows for a better affinity maturation and the development of more potent immune responses. The bond is non-toxic and irreversible, even under denaturing conditions, such as uh, reducing and uh, denaturing SDS page uh, gel running conditions. Because the reaction is enzymatic, it's a, it allows tight control of the reaction through the addition of specific starting and stopping reagents. As I mentioned, the, the bond is fo formed on fully folded molecules, and therefore it avoids nonspecific ag aggregation or the difficulties associated with disulfide bond engineering where the bond forms while the molecule is folding. So much less conformational or structural analysis can be applied. The diatyrosine bond has specific properties in that it's fluorescent at specific excitation and emission wavelengths. Shown on the top left here is the pH dependence of that fluorescence. And this enables the tracking of diatyrosine bond formation, even when they are present in intramolecular structures and uh, allows the monitoring of the formation of bond formation in real time. The reaction is fast as on the second time scale as shown on the bottom left. And because the bond is irreversible, it enables analysis of intermolecular crosslinks by gel shift analysis under denaturing and reducing conditions. And this can be tracked on Kumasi gels and or Western block as shown on the top and bottom panels on the right. So in RSV, 
We sought to further stabilize the pre-fusion conformation by introducing dityrosine bonds at specific locations that comprise the major, an, uh, major antigenic site of neutralizing antibodies against the RSVF protein. We specifically targeted site zero at the top of the molecule shown on the right with a DT1 bond and the site four or five interface shown at the side of the molecule on the right and with the DT2 bond. The DT2 bond is intermolecular and therefore formation of that bond can be readily tracked by this gel shift analysis under denaturing and reducing conditions as shown on the left before and after crosslinking. We have further evidence that, of this bond formation by actual direct sequencing evidence by mass spectrometry, where we were able to detect the covalent crosslink between these two side chains in the DT2 bond. The DT1 bond has been harder to detect by mass spectrometry, presumably due to uh, inefficient proteolysis of the protein by, structural, by the structural rigidity imparted by the bond. However, we have evidence of its formation in that we've performed amino acid analysis, which demonstrates that there are more than three bonds per molecule. And additionally, we analytically perform HPLC size exclusion analysis under denaturing conditions. And an inline fluorimeter is associated with this analysis. And we can demonstrate that the monomeric protein does in fact contain fluorescence. It should be noted that mass spectrometry does not identify any other nonspecific dityrosine bonds in the molecule, which demonstrates that the cross-linking reaction and the targeting of these bonds is highly specific. DT3F, as our molecule is called, maintains the pre-fusion conformation better than DSCAP1 and has improved upon its both in vitro and in vivo stability. In vitro data is shown here, where a highly specific, pre-fusion specific antibody is used to track the loss of the pre-fusion state over time and storage of the protein at four degrees. We've compared our molecule, DT3F, head to head with the DSCAV1 molecule developed by the Vaccine Research Center. And we can show that over this time frame of a total of 12 weeks, the DSCAV1 molecule significantly loses its pre-fusion confirmation, especially between the three and five week period, whereas DT3F maintains the pre-fusion anti antigenicity over this time. This is graphically represented in this slide, where the time frame is taken out to the five week time point, where the differences are readily observable. As I mentioned, we believe that the improved stability of the molecule translates into greater potency by in vivo exposure upon vaccination. And we're able to show in head-to-head -head mouse immunization studies that we achieve roughly a three-fold increase in mean neutralization titers upon vaccination on alum with equivalent amounts of immunogen in a head-to-head -head study between DT pre-F and DS Cav1. And most interestingly, we're able to demonstrate that the dityrosine bonding present in DT3F improves the shelf life of the molecule. So we performed an analogous experiment to the in vitro analysis. However, after the incubation period, we then used the protein to vaccinate mice and compared vaccination with the four degree storage protein over a period of four weeks to protein freshly thawed on the day of, an infection, of vaccination. And therefore, we're able to compare head to head the loss of potency or stability and the shelf life of the molecule over time upon storage at four degrees. You can see in the neutralization titers on the left, and the graphical representation on the right, that DT3F maintained its 
confirmational integrity and potency over this four week period of four degree storage, losing only 6%, which is statistically indiscriminate over this time frame. Whereas the DSCAV1 molecule lost a little uh, close to 60% of its potency. We believe this will have clinical relevance if a reconstituted lyophilized product is stored in refrigerators upon vaccinating patients. We also performed some adjuvant selection experiments with the DT pre F molecule with an aim towards recruiting both arms of the immune system. We tested or aimed to identify some Th1 skewing adjuvants or Th1 biased adjuvants that still achieved high neutralization titers, demonstrating an engagement of both Th1 and Th2 type immune responses. And we were happy to find that the adjuvant ADVAX, specifically ADVAX SM, which contains some CPG oligonucleotide, is able to both maintain the high neutralization titers that we observe on alum and also has a Th1 bias to the immune response. And this is evidenced on the left by the mean and total neutralization titers, whereas the fold excess is shown on top over DSCAV1. And on the right by IgG ratio analysis, serum analysis, where the levels of IgG2A are, and IgG1 are quantified, the ratio of which determines the bias of the immune response whereas a ratio over one indicates a Th1 bias, and a ratio of less than one indicates a Th2 bias. You can see on the right that formulation with ADVAX does in fact accomplish a Th1 bias while maintaining these high neutralization titers. We further perform process developments and now we're able to achieve a fourfold excess of our molecule when formulated on ADVAX as compared to DSCAV1. In agreement with the TH1 bias to the immune response, we looked at CD8 T cells in response to vaccination with the different adjuvant, and we're able to show, in fact, that the TH1 bias does recruit more CD8 T cells that are F specific in both zero negative and zero positive animals, demonstrating a real bias and recruitment of balanced responses against generating both TH1 and TH2 type responses when the neutralization titer data is coupled with the T cell analysis. We also tested DT pre-F in cotton rats. In this study, uh, the molecules were formulated on alum, and we tested two different doses of DT pre-F formulated on alum and cotton rats, a two and a 10 microgram dose. And we're able to show that both doses are able to achieve sterile lungs, as shown on the left with the challenge uh, post-vaccination and incubation, and considerably higher neutralization titers are observed against both RSVA and RSVB viruses, as compared to the positive control in this study, which is live RSV infection. We also performed a competition, ELISA, that demonstrated that primarily pre-F specific epitopes are targeted by the immune agent. Switching now to the hemagglutinin molecule, as I mentioned before, the hemagglutinin contains immunodominant epitopes in the variable head domain that distract from the more conserved epitopes present in the spot. So the immunodominant epitopes in the head are highlighted in red here whereas the primary stock epitope that's been identified is shown in green. Because of the head's immunodominance, responses against the head 
result in antigenic drift and mutation of the molecule. And therefore, the vaccine needs to be updated on a yearly basis. Immune responses to the stock domain, however, are more broad and cross-reactive and have the potential to generate a universal influenza virus vaccine. However, current attempts to remove the head proteolytically or recombinantly have failed to generate a completely intact stock domain and therefore have lacked potency. Our approach is to target dityrosine bonds into the fully folded, full-length molecule shown here on the left at the top of the apex of the stock domain. Additionally, we engineer proteolytic cleavage sites in the region between the globular head and the stock domain to accomplish proteolytic removal of the head. These two approaches are combined into one molecule. And the reaction is conducted so that dityrosine cross-linking is accomplished first in the fully folded molecule. And subsequently, proteolysis occurs to remove the globular head domain. And this allows us to maintain the conformational integrity of the stock domain in the absence of the head, since it's gleaned from a full length, fully folded molecule, we expect it to have potency advantages over different over, over other approaches. For the influenza HA, we've designed at least three dityrosine crosslinks shown here. On the left, we've targeted the stock apex and its interprotomer bond aimed at preserving conformational integrity upon head removal. We have a slightly lower interprotomer bond shown in the center. And we also have an intraprotomer bond that we've designed on the right. All of these designs avoid the region in green and permit access to the primary neutral, neutralizing epitopes present on the stalk. It was much more difficult to engineer the proteolytic cleavage site into the molecule, as the dityrosine crosslinks of all three shown previously form and, and stabilize the molecule. However, it was much more difficult to engineer the proteolytic cleavage sites into the molecule. It took several years and more than, uh, more than 100 construct designs. However, we've now identified cleavage sites present at the N and C terminal locations and the interface in between the globular head and the stock domain. And we've done some optimization with the C terminal cleavage site. And we're able to accomplish near wild type expression of the molecule upon slight modulation of this C terminal cleavage site. And that's shown by ELISA here, whereas the wild type PRA pro protein, which is the background that we generate our headless HA molecule in, is shown in gray and represents the top curve. Shown in between red and blue is the expression improvements that we've made based on the modulation of this C-terminal cleavage site. Additionally, we've optimized the proteolytic cleavage reaction and now have near quantitative cleavage of the molecule so as I mentioned previously, uh, after DT crosslinking, the protein is locked in intermolecular crosslinks and therefore shifts into the trimeric state shown on the left with the inset. And after proteolytic cleavage, the molecule shown after the latter on the right demonstrates near quantitative conversion and cleavage of the globular head domain and a shifting in size that corresponds with the molecular weight lost 
in the intervening region between the two proteolytic cleavage sites. At this time, we were able to show stock antigenicity is maintained between the crosslink only in blue and the crosslink and cleaved proteins in red. We then conducted a purification uh, process development, and we now have a purification process in place that yields pure DT headless HA, and we're ready to begin our first murine vaccination study. Uh, while the previous slide demonstrated a, the protein solely after cross-linking and cleavage, this, these slides represent the final molecule after complete purification. Purity is shown on the right, where the DT headless HA band is indicated by the arrow. And we can show that we still maintain both stock binding integrity, and importantly, we can show the complete absence of the head using a linear epitope antibody, PY-102, which uh, works in Western block. So therefore, if proteolytic cleavage solely destroyed the conformation of the head, uh, we would still pick it up with the PY-102 uh, antibody. And we're set to begin our mouse immunogenicity study in uh, next month. That brings me to the end of the talk, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Calder Biosciences team members, both past and present, are shown on the left. Our grant support is below that. The members of our scientific advisory board are shown in the middle. Our consultants below that. And our collaborators in Universal Flu on the left and RSV are shown on the right. And we would thank, like to thank as well everyone who contributed to this research.